Hey, welcome to session 2B. This is a uh, adaption to climate change, heat, air pollution, and human health. I'm Daniel Tong, I'm your moderator today. We have four wonderful speakers today. Uh, two are belonging to the HICAP team. And uh, uh, we also have two stakeholders. I believe they are both first time comers. Welcome. Our first speaker is uh, Lei Cho Hu from University of Alabama, Huntsville. He, uh, she is working with uh, Chris. Yeah. Um, good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, today, um, I would show some, I'd like to share some of um, Today, I'd like to share some of the updates about uh, our development of the new concept uh, uh, called the ground urban heat island uh, that derived from the cell light remote sensing that can better apply for um, the local or urban heat risk management. Um, so, sorry. okay. And as uh, you know, the thermal observations from NASA and other space agencies become quite available. So we see a dramatic increase of directly applied thermal observations uh, to uh, urban heat island study. And compared to the sparsely distributed air temperature uh, stations, um, definitely remote sensing techniques uh, can provide uh, uh, great spatial advantages that can sp uh, scan the large spatial uh, areas uh, instantaneously. So that provide us a very great spatial temperature structures over urban um, areas. Um, however, um, you know, remote sensing uh, directly, so, uh, there, there are some inherited limitations about satellite observations. If we're using some of the frequent observations, which means the, the satellite scans are very wide swath uh, uh, areas. The, so some of the observation can be subjected to different angle, uh, like a viewing from different angles. So when the uh, satellite views sunlit angle, that can be much warmer than the, the sun shaded uh, like uh, sides of the surfaces and cause some of the spatial uh, uncertainties when we're doing the application. So this kind of uncertainty can be sometimes large. And so highly recommend using some narrow swath sensors for uh, the very detailed urban applications. And even we have this perfect donator view uh, observations. Um, this is a two example pictures from uh, France City, uh, Massey and uh, uh, Brooklyn over New York City, uh, in New York City. And you can see the things that with uh, a large uh, fractions of roof coverage, this roof different pro uh, properties actually can influence the temperature we observe from satellite directly. And uh, most of our, of our activities on the ground, so what more ex experienced, uh, experienced to the atmosphere and the radiations on the floor levels of the city. So uh, the, the figures on the right in showing the simulations uh, compare the OST on the ground versus the OST on the roof. And you can see at the different, uh, uh, like a straight canyon morphologies from very wide straight to a very you know deep canyons, uh, the roof temperature and floor temperature can be very uh, dramatically during the daytime. So this actually some of the you know some of uncertainties that we are facing. However, um, I would say you know satellite data is wonderful because that pro uh, there are some of the actual observational levels that. Uh, at the ground level, there's support our using of a land surface temperature. This is a, group, a study from a group from ASU and using those uh, this called Marty uh, stations. And we, uh, I just read analysis their data set and just to uh, plot uh, the air temperature they measure against the mean radiant temperature, which is a critical component that contribute to the thermal comfort. And uh, from the left uh, uh, scatter plots for air temperature and the right, uh, the right side is for the uh, ground LST. And you can see uh, LST actually uh, have a dramatic uh, uh, better performances in predict the spatial uh, radiant uh, uh, like a uh, load on pedestrians. And uh, also this, uh, we test other like a uh, uh, physiological equivalent temperature and UTCI universal thermal comfort indexes and also showing OST on the ground actually um, uh, much better uh, for spatial, um, you know, heat uh, like um, uh, uh, variation. 
So here, they, we, we, we want to uh, fill those gaps and mentioned in the past. And, uh, you know, from satellite data at the grid, uh, at the each pixel level, uh, most of the data cannot resolve the tree canopy rooftops. So here we come up some of the idea, uh, solution by statistic downscale uh, those urban elements and using, uh, you know, high resolution urban land cover maps. So this approach allow us to do some of the approximation, uh, uh, like estimation of the different elements temperatures. So uh, we have made assumptions and then, you know, at the neighborhood scale, like a 300 by 50 meter scales, we have relative similar, uh, like material structures. And also we does uh, the downscale temperature does not distinguish any kind of illumination conditions. So we ex estimate the, uh, the mean temperatures under those uh, pixel sub pixel level. So um, then we reconstructed the LST uh, on the ground and uh, just only account to uh, the roof, uh, like, uh, sorry, the impreviousness uh, on the ground and the roads and the also grasslands that's uh, the uh, human activity that directly uh, related. And then for the comparison, we reconstruct the LST at the pixel levels that including roof and the tree canopies. Um, so here, 35 different um, like images represent diurnal um, heat maps over New York were tested. And so um, this is scatter plot for different time snapshots we analyzed. The, the pink distributions represent the ground LST, the blue is for the pixel level. So here you can see generally they at, at look very similar in terms of distribution. Um, aggregated distribution, but generally you will see a larger spatial variation of the LST on the ground. And also the mean high uh, temperature of the LST on the ground is generally higher than the pixel level. So, and this is just give you an example of about the day night and spatial map of the ground urban heat island. Generally we can see a warmer, like a, you know, a location like um, Manhattan as uh, then the uh, Standard Islands. And uh, there are spatial variation of the ground urban heat island minus the, uh, the surface urban heat island. You can see actually, uh, you can pay attention to the scale for day and night. It, the variation can up to seven to eight degrees differences during the daytime. So generally this differences, what we're using pixel level, ground level can be very localized and much more random. It's not uh, like uh, there are some kind of uh, systematic patterns that yeah. mainly can be controlled by the local urban composites and their morphology and properties. And so um, I will skip that. So later uh, we're trying to ex uh, kind of explore what caused this uh, spatial variation of the ground urban heat islands. So the main link, because we removed the tree canopies and building roof, they have a different diurnal temperature compared to their uh, other components on the ground. For example, there's uh, um, like a roof are typically warmer than the in, uh, in previous ground and roads. And also the treetops uh, warmer than the grassland during the daytime. So that, that's some of the differences that cause, directly cause their differences. And uh, statistically, uh, we, we're trying to analyze uh, different component uh, urban properties at local scales, uh, how, they def uh, how they control the ground urban heat island. There's some kind of key take home um, messages that we can get from. Um, so these two pan of plots with arrows on that is uh, indicate the building density and mean building hiding influences on the ground um, uh, urban heat island. So generally we're showing uh, the tracking effects and the urban canyon can trap long wave and short wave radiations that can keep the ground warmer actually have larger effects than the shading effect that they, they provide. So also the roof reflectance have some of the neg uh, like negative correlated with the ground LST. So they have some impacts on the ground level temperatures and also the coverage of the ground impervious also positively correlated to LST on the ground. That means more impervious generally and have a uh, more exposure to the sunlight uh, so that can be warmer. Vegetation uh, overall they provide much cooling effects particularly during the day, but they, uh, but process wise, they are actually, uh, uh, they play some of the different roles um, uh, indirectly and directly. So here we also trying to explain what make their differences, uh, you know, uh, um, 
uh, surface Ar 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 Island or ground Ar Ar Island. So the only uh, like uh, the vegetation coverage can statistic statistically explain their differences, um, but generally we're showing a larger data effect in the nighttime. So to summarize, um, here we're showing, you know, for depends on our application trying to use the satellite data. For large scale comparison, I think it's perfectly fine to using the directly Earth observations. And if we want to be a more precise at local scales, um, some of the, you know, we probably want to uh, uh, did, uh, do a further analysis and as uh, using ground urban heat island. Um, so based on the application, so uh, here is the plots that we aggregate the, the data at census track level or zip code level and showing the differences of the ground urban heat island and the surface urban heat island. You can see there are some temperature range differences, larger scale. Um, I'm going to show. Uh, I want to stop here. Just means because American cities have a lot of the data resources. Uh, this uh, this general framework allowed us to for a broader application for many American cities. But just want to show, uh, just bring up this concept uh, to better uh, data set for application and adaptation. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I know the time is very short, but uh, we have time for discussion and questions. So please write down your questions, either uh, put it there in the internet or you can uh, ask it later in person. Our second speaker, uh, All right. <clears throat> Okay, great. Um, so our second speaker is Chelsea Nanger from New Mexico uh, Department of Health. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm with the Department of Health. I work for the Environmental Public Health Tracking Program. Um, we were fortunate enough to partner with um, Colorado State and Georgia Tech um, University with air quality measures, as well as Florida State and University of Alabama Huntsville um, for heat measures. And we were also fortunate enough to host um, Olivia Sublon, who is a grad student with the Colorado group um, earlier this spring. <clears throat> so with environmental public health tracking, um, as was mentioned before, it's a CDC funded network of 33 jurisdictions. Um, New Mexico has been a part of it from the beginning. So since 2002, uh, our main product is the NM tracking portal that has a variety of information on environmentally related health outcomes as well as environmental hazards. Um, and you can see there's the fire and smoke page on the portal. Um, so the first part, I'll talk about air quality and PM 2.5 monitoring. Uh, New Mexico is the fifth largest state by area. We have about 2 million people. So we rank about 45th or 46th um, population density wise. Um, very varied climate and geography. It's not all just desert. Uh, we do have the Southern tip of the Rockies. We have the Eastern Plains. We have white sands. We have the high um, desert in the Northwest. Um, and then you can see the counties, the five counties um, that are in color are the only counties in the state that actually have EPA air monitors. That does cover the bulk of the population, um, but you can see it does not cover anywhere near the bulk of the area. Um, so the Haycast collaboration came about after the 2022 wildfire season, which was um, a historic year for New Mexico. We had our two largest fires in state history, each burning over 300,000 acres. Um, the Calf Canyon Hermit's Peak Fire was in the northeast part of the state, and then the Black Fire was in the southwest part of the state. Um, and total in 22, there were over 21 fires, um, or 21 fires that burned over 1,000 acres, with over 900,000 acres burned around the state. Um, and this picture is from the Calf Canyon Hermit's Peak smoke that you could see from Taos. Um, so with the historic season, um, we had daily smoke coordination calls. Um, these were coordinated by the United States Forest Service. We also had the State Forest Service, 
Department of Health, um, the Environment Department, Air Quality Bureau, as well as other partners um, would meet every day to assess the situation, see where the smoke patterns were projected to go, and then issue um, alerts if it was expected to impact populations, and also add the health messaging um, from our side. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk primarily about the Colorado work since Olivia um, was here earlier this spring. So we looked at um, PM 2.5 attributable to wildfire smoke estimates, and then um, also looked at health outcomes. So the two um, main exposure estimates were um, satellite data with the EPA air monitors that are in the yellow block. So you can see not a lot of them and in those five counties. Um, and then also adding in the purple air monitors, which did add in um, quite a bit. There were about 70 um, purple air monitors scattered around the state. Um, and then looking at emergency department visits from 2016 to 2022 um, at the zip code level, and then looking at multiple health outcomes, including respiratory as well as cardiovascular outcomes. So what we found really interesting was the difference in um, looking at satellites with only the EPA air monitors on the left where you don't really see a clear smoke signal. Um, and this is specifically for 22. And then the map on the right adds in the purple air monitors or the low cost sensors. And you can see that purple area is the Calf Canyon Hermit's Peak fire. And then down below in the Southwest, um, you can see that's the black um, fire. Now with the um, health outcomes, we did see an effect with all respiratory visits as well as pneumonia specifically. And then for cardiovascular, we saw an effect with um, heart failure, ischemic heart disease and myocardial infarction. Um, now, we also had um, looking at heat because obviously New Mexico, it's very hot there. Um, we have a lot of heat uh, illness. So the graph on the left shows the increase in heat stress deaths from 2010 to 2022, um, which deaths around the state basically quadrupled in that time frame. And then the map has it by region. So you can see the regions that are most impacted um, with the Northwest region having the highest um, rate of heat deaths followed by the Southern parts of the state. Um, so with Chris's team at Florida State, we'll be doing a couple of uh, heat exposure analyses, looking at it spatially and temporally, um, also looking at ED visits and hospitalizations. Um, those results will be coming soon and will be very exciting for us when we get them. And then we also, in the meantime, have the um, urban heat maps, which Lake U worked on, um, which show the daytime surface temperature as well as we have the daytime nighttime temperatures for 26 cities around the state. Um, we have been, I've been giving a lot of talks recently on heat and a heat planning workshop with city planners and emergency planners and emergency management. And you know, really trying to get the word out that we now have this resource and people do seem very excited about it. And we had a regional director who's looking at putting up cooling shelters, um, was very excited and could actually use these maps to try to figure out the best place to put the cooling shelters, um, which is very exciting to see them being used. So yay. Um, Future work, we have applied for brick funding, which is through FEMA, it's the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. Um, there's also a proposed public health and climate program that needs to go past the legislature. So hopefully the third time is the charm. Um, in the meantime, and if any of those come to fruition, we'll focus on the communities most um, in need and most at risk and continue to assess and model potential health outcomes and climate events in the meantime and continue our statewide uh, communications and outreach. <clears throat> All the acknowledgements. Um, and yeah, please feel free to email or call if you have any questions or after this. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Jossie. Uh, so it's uh, wonderful news. It's good to know that data has been in use. We uh, have the next speaker is uh, Professor Chun Chu Mao. He's a member of Tika. Okay, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, show you what we have done in the past few years about Wi-Fi in Alaska. I'm glad Chelsea just showed that um, New Mexico is the fifth uh, largest state in US. <laughs> Do you guys know what's the largest one? <laughs> Which one is? It's actually Alaska. It's at, here, let me show you. And this, if you look at the upper left, Alaska is, as, is actually more than twice bigger than Texas. Texas is the second largest state. So it's quite huge. And there are a lot of Wi-Fi burning in Alaska. And um, it's also very unique because in lower 48, that's how we call it. You guys, lower 48, then once there are fire, you guys will put out. But in Alaska, we just let it burn because unless there's really life threatening situation, we just let things burn. And uh, those things can burn for weeks, even months. And uh, another really unique feature is that it's mostly you burn the tree very quickly, you actually burn the soil. The soil has lots of organic matter, like uh, the litter from trees and the, the tough layer, because tough layer is very rich in organic matters. And the, there is a very a huge moisture in there. You can just burn the temperatures really much lower than the flaming from the fires in California. It's mostly smoldering. Once you smolder, you're making a lot more organic air, a lot less black heart. And uh, then it's just kept burning for Weeks, a month, sometimes it can burn very deep. You can even see the peaks and they're very deep down. So it's kind of amazing that how fire are going in Alaska. Well, it's still, still very little attention. The problem is that not many people live there. That's really, uh, so, well, this, um, a lot of people say, why should we care about that? But uh, on the other hand, there are lots of tribal communities living in Alaska. They are suffering really badly from wildfire. They always ask me, how do they know the air quality is bad enough so they can decide not to go our fishing, we can decide not to go out hiking, hiking and fixing Alaska. Um, so, uh, so we decided to take the, uh, do something about it. So here on the other hand, there are very few measurements in Alaska. The whole state of Alaska, large state of Alaska, we not, only have six EQS uh, uh, sites, six. Actually, mostly they're in Fairbanks and uh, uh, Anchorage. Fortunately enough, in recent years, there have been a lot more purple air sensors. So we like to take advantage of purple air sensor combined with AQS sites to, to help us to really infer surface uh, PM 2.5 during wildfire season. So that's something, as you can see here in the lower right, there's uh, the purple air sensor and the air now is only like six of them. They're mostly Anchorage and the Fairbanks. And the, we are also taking advantage of AirNet because AirNet can let us know how AOD from satellite is, how good it is. So we're using AirNet to validate uh, satellite first and satellite has a very um, daily special coverage and we're using all the polar orbiter satellites to help us understand quantified surface um, PM 2.5. So this is what we do. This is led by my resident. Kinan Zhao is in collaboration with Paiwan Gupta as well as Jun Wang. And we're, as I showed earlier, so we're trying to develop a quick and a direct method to estimate surface daily PM 2.5 in Wi-Fi season. Because there, if you want to use model, we actually try to use GLSCAM model. Turns out model cannot capture this relationship between AOD, which is the column density, to surface, surface PM 2.5. That relationship in model, which in GLSCAM in this case, is not great. <laughs> it's actually kind of by factor of five to 10. So it's amazing how if you use that, then we decide to uh, look at Calypso, look at how AOD is vertically distributed in, at different layers. And then we combine with all the information, we develop a direct uh, piecewise in, uh, function to derive surface PM 2.5 during Wi-Fi season. This on the, on the right is the uh, data we infer and we compare with proper air. We realize actually it's not bad. It's okay. On the other hand, I want to emphasize that if you look at this, this area here, that's where most Yukon flights, most tribal communities live, and they suffer really badly. And the PM 2.5, daily PM 2.5, can be as much as 60 micrograms per cubic meter. That's huge. That's really, really bad. And uh, so these sums deserve a, a lot more attention, and we're hoping to deliver this information to them. And, uh, well, you know, Chios Camp is a, probably many of you know, it's a global model. It's not as that great in terms of resolving the fire bloom uh, transport. So 
uh, not aggressively my group, uh, the way he's, um, okay, I didn't see him, but anyway, uh, so we trying to look at another model is called HRR model. This is a high resolution model divided by NOAA. They have to uh, make it operational in Alaska since 2020. This is a really great model, give you very good information about uh, wildfire bloom at a three by three kilometer. This is much, much higher resolution and it's real time. And we are using that combined with machine learning to understand, to, to better derive surface PM 2.5. Here I'm showing you, if you look at the uh, plot on the, okay, uh, on, the, on the right, that the her model is actually largely, largely underestimated surface PM 2.5 due to uh, many reasons. I can, you can, uh, we can talk later about that, but this is just something and then we decide to use machine learning combined with all the proper air, all the surface measurements. We can improve that by using this uh, machine learning model is called CN1D convolution, um, convolutional neural network, 1D. And it turns out you can really highly improve that uh, forecast using her model output. And then we can have much better understand, uh, estimate of surface daily PM 2.5 during wildfire season. The third project we've been going on is that uh, we've been also using uh, Gene Wan's group, uh, this called Ensemble Common Filter to come up with proper air, uh, really can help to correct model bias. I'm not gonna get too much uh, into that. And, uh, but it's, it's also, a, this is the third method we are using. And uh, also I want to emphasize in recent years, my group has been collaborating with um, Michael Han at UAA, University of Alaska Anchorage. We're trying to develop some Wi-Fi smoke metrics. This is something we're trying to look at the number of days with a uh, lot of fire and the number of smoke wave. There's a definition of what's smoke wave and then number of uh, also uh, long, lens of longest smoke wave. And use that information, we can actually see most places in Alaska, those are tribal um, communities that are suffering mostly from wildfire. So if, if you look at in the middle plot, this is the number of smoke waves has most is in the Yukon flat area. That's where most tribal communities live right now. And uh, so this does, uh, with this, all the information we have, we can really uh, address some environmental justice problems there. Um, so last, and uh, also, uh, not last, is also we are, besides PM 2.5, we also look at formaldehyde. We realize in our case, formaldehyde, most satellites cannot see formaldehyde really well, except, except once you have uh, wildfires. Because once you have Wi-Fi, we've been looking at the past 10, 10 years records of formaldehyde from OMI and the uh, AMPS. We can really see the Wi-Fi drives formaldehyde into annual variability at lower high latitudes. And uh, at last is that I want to introduce, uh, we start to work with uh, stakeholders. We're trying to de deliver our information to local fire man management uh, systems. They have a, something called wi Alaska Wildfire Information Map Service serious and this largely based on GIS system. We are trying to convert our data into GIS format and then deliver that information to them. This from GSFP and this year we're planning to do high resolution model and crack it with machine learning model and to deliver that to uh, the whole uh, GIS system. And then they can use that to better inform the public about wildfire smoke uh, impact on health and uh, air quality. Okay, with that, thank you for your attention. All right, our last speaker in the panel is uh, Sherry Scully. Oh, Sherry. Sorry, right. um, from National Institute of Health. Yeah. Okay, now for something completely different. And I wanna thank Chris for making the connect here um, about the All of Us Research Program, which is an NIH funded initiative and sort of what can be done with all the great work you guys are doing here. So um, gonna try to run through this in eight minutes, but really glad we have a lot of discussion time. So uh, the All of Us Research Program is um, really, uh, the mission is to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs by enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. So we do this in three ways. Uh, the first is nurturing um, partnerships with our participants. And we hope to nurture uh, partnerships for decades with at least 1 million or more uh, participants who reflect the broad diversity of the United States. Uh, second is we're delivering one of the largest, richest uh, biomedical data sets that's broadly available and secure. And I'll talk a lot about that. 
And then finally, we want to catalyze an ecosystem of communities, researchers, and funders who make all of us an indispensable part of health research. And in my mind, bringing in really um, clear environmental exposures is part of making that happen. So we have over 800,000 participants who have signed up to be part of the program. Um, almost 550,000 now have done the initial steps of the program, meaning that they've given a bio specimen, have um, answered our initial surveys, and have um, authorized for linkage to electronic health records. Um, you can see that we actually have participants across um, the United States, including Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Guam. And um, these are numbers as of May, so these have increased over time. This is sort of a heat map, so we show where our participants are um, more concentrated is in the darker colors. One of the main tenets of the All of Us Research Program is diversity. And we really want to be making sure that we're representing those who have not been represented in health research to date. And so we focus not only on racial and ethnic minorities, but also on other underserved populations, including low income, rural populations, sexual gender minorities, et cetera. So really trying to bring in those who have not been part of the evidence base to drive clinical research to date. And so 85% of our participants are what we call underrepresented biomedical research. And that's really where our focus is. A lot of the hardest hit communities, which this group is also thinking about. We have, um, I mentioned that we are really building an infrastructure for people to leverage. Um, this is our latest data set, which actually um, will be updated uh, later this year, likely in September. And you can see all of the biological and public health sort of data that we have. We do whole genome sequencing on everyone. We actually return results to our participants so we can engage them in health. I would love to do the same with environmental factors as well, so they can sort of make decisions about what's best for them. Um, and here's a QR code if you want to just take a look at the data. It's actually uh, pretty open. You go through a, a training, sign a data use agreement, and then you're in the data and actually can do several things. So you can imagine taking this resource and then making sure we add in the right environmental exposures, which I have totally been geeking out at this meeting because I am so excited about the potential collaborations. Right now we have three digit zip code linkages to the American Community Society, uh, sorry, survey. And all of you know that that's really not getting at the granularity that we need to get at to really drive health in these populations. Uh, we are planning on adding additional environmental linkages and we're doing that through our Center for Linkage and Acquisition of Data. Uh, we're starting out with Environmental Justice Index and um, are really gonna try to drive down from there and get more granular and get satellite data and things like that where you know, we can actually do some much more dynamic things. Uh, we are going to be putting out an environmental exposure and occupational health survey so we can really get at what our participants' views about what their exposures have been. Um, and then we are going to be geocoding our participants and sort of um, thinking about how we can have higher levels of data access that allow for more individual level geocoded data so we can bring in tools like this group is developing here. Uh, I'll just mention that for a sub, uh, set of our cohort, we're actually doing untargeted mass spec exposomics, so we can actually get an idea of the biological exposures that folks have had. Um, but really want to focus here on, you know, the things that we have planned for the near term, I think can be really augmented and accelerated by this group and the exciting things that are happening here. And I'd love to talk about further collaborations. So uh, with that, I think we can launch into our discussion questions. But um, here's the, the QR code again for data access. And at any time, I'd be happy to chat about potential collaboration. So my email is right up there at the top. And Daniel. Yeah, we would like to invite all the panelists to come up. We have plenty of time to ask your questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. All right. Um, I have a question about the Alaskan wildfires. Um, is anything being tracked on what the impact is ecologically on the area and how ecological impacts are affecting the tribal communities or is it just strictly the 
there's a very little knowledge to my knowledge that's just something really being handled studying right. so far um I, just for the benefit of folks online uh -huh. i would ask uh, the speaker uh, the, the people asking questions, please line up here so we can use some microphone. We only have one microphone in this room. Um, I see the microphone, so it should be to the entire room now. Okay, we should be. So people can hear. Uh, okay. okay, so that's great. So you can speak anywhere you want. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Okay, maybe I should just repeat my answer that this has, we do not have much knowledge about the impact on ecosystem, uh, as well as just, let's, let's be very much understudied. The people being uh, realized is, uh, in different countries, I've been also uh, collaborating with people in Europe. They also kind of start seeing the importance of studying Arctic wildfire right now. I'm, I'm glad HICAS is also uh, investing on that. Right. So HICAS is actually it's a lateral building group. Uh, so you, many of you actually are new to us. If you don't mind, you can introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, briefly. I think that would be very helpful for our group. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, my name is Xiao Hua Pan from NASA Gardard. So I have a question for Sherry, right? The name? Sherry? Sherry. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Sherry. Sherry. Oh, <laughs> the last speaker about the edge. edge. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just mentioned you want to get some NASA satellite data, right? Mm -hmm. So which data are you interested in? I think that's what we would love to have uh, conversations about where the lowest hanging fruit is for collaboration and then how we can grow from there. As I mentioned, right now, our environmental data is extremely high level, and it really doesn't provide meaningful data on what environmental exposures people have had. Yeah, I think there's lots to discuss and um, lots of opportunities as well. Yeah. So I don't know the short answer to that. Yeah, if you have any questions, by the way, I'm from one of the NASA data yeah. center. Yeah. So welcome to talk to me. OK, great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can help you. Great. <laughs> Uh, the one on the back first. Okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> I have a question for Chelsea. Um, you mentioned that there was a smoke coordination calls. The Forest Service was helping run um, to get forecasts together and also send out public communication. And I was wondering what successes and gaps you may have seen in the public communication side. Um, I am doing work with prescribed fires in California and we're working on smoke communication. So it'd be great to hear like successes and lessons learned from that effort. Yeah, um, so yeah, I, I forgot to mention the National Weather Service also doing those calls. And so they would provide, you know, like the weather forecast and the wind forecast. Um, for 22 specifically, it's, um, I think we had 80 some air quality alerts and I think at the very beginning, we didn't include the health information and then very quickly put in the at least link to like the tracking portal that has a 531 visibility tool that we developed a number of years ago where, and you know, if you're in one of the more vulnerable high risk groups, this is what you do. If you're not, then this is what you do. Um, we have had, so just, within the last couple of weeks, we've had a couple of fires that we've had to reamp these smoke coordination calls. And a definite limitation is that um, it's a lot of rural areas that are hard to reach and also hard to know who exactly to contact and disseminate information to. Um, which in the smoke coordination calls, we look at like the bigger population centers and then realized, you know, these small towns are affected and should be alerted of that and should also have the same information provided to them that we would provide to anywhere else in the state. Um, also, there was a lot of questions about, you know, where can people go for help and resources? Um, so we were working with our emergency management bureau to kind of see how we could facilitate that and actually get the information where it needed to go. Um, so there's plenty of room for. Yeah, if anybody has a question, go ahead next. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Chelsea. I also have a question for you. You um, introduce yourself. I just, <laughs> you know, I'm honored to know you. Yeah, I'm Wenhui Liu. 
um, now at MIT, I, um, during my PhD, I also focused on um, heat um, uh, related health burden. But I have a question, maybe really basic question. Is that um, heat related health burden equals to high temperature related health burden? And how can we drive the urban heat related um, health impacts? So, um, do we have some common method or some popular method to, um, to deal with this question? <laughs> yeah. um, so are you asking about using the urban heat maps and relating that to heat outcomes? Uh, I mean, to see the heat related health impacts. Uh, like the mortality, like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I see from your uh, slides here show some heat stress. I'm mean, not sure if it's similar to health impacts. So that is um, the one that had the map with the colors and then the yeah. graph. So we get. Um, Within tracking, we get emergency department visits and hospitalizations and deaths um, around the state. And so we we basically search those records for the specific ICD codes that are related to heat. And then based on the patient's county of residence is how they're assigned. So that map showed people who died from heat illness in that time frame and what counties they were from. So um, the first question maybe is the uh, heat is the heat related um, heat equals to the high temperature. <laughs> so we've done um, separate analyses with um, I believe it was emergency department data um, correlating visits. It was emergency department and hospitalizations um, corresponding visits to um, temperatures, yeah. and we saw. Most um, visits were within like 80 degrees to 104, 105, with 94 degrees being kind of the threshold. Um, so, and trying to use that in messaging and warning and alerts, like getting the information out before people really start to think about it, because in New Mexico, at least 95 degrees is not uncommon at all. Um, so trying to get it at like 80 degrees when people aren't thinking about it yet and are more susceptible and haven't built up the, haven't acclimatized yet and the more vulnerable populations. Um, not sure that actually answered your question. No, so sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Keelan Bishop from the American Cancer Society. Um, my question is about the All of Us data set. And please excuse me if this is easily answered because I'm not super familiar. So do you all collect information on residential history prior to enrollment? Yes. And we're actually going to be doing um, more sophisticated data linkages to find out more about residential history for those who may not know um, their residential history as well and then linking to sort of lead exposures and things like that over time. So. Yeah, and that is, leads right into my second question, which is uh, I know uh, a lot of people geocode to residential address and don't necessarily consider where someone goes for work or play. So to what extent are you kind of creating um, or thinking about like life course interactions, especially as how those pattern environmental exposures? That's the reason why we're starting to look at residential history as a whole. Um, and we are also capturing occupational history as much as possible. The play part's hard, right? Uh, it's hard to get at that for everyone, but I would love to chat with you more about your ideas there too, because we're just developing them. Thank you. I have a follow-up question for Shari. So what a resolution <laughs> and follow a special resolution data set that you're looking at? Well, given that we have three digit zip code right now, I think that anything is an improvement over that. Um, but really trying to understand what is the best combination or how can we even get to a point where within the data set, people can bring in their own tools, like many of the ones that were developed here and um, really apply those to the data set so we can start to get different views on what health uh, and these exposures look like. 
as, as a more holistic um, view, because we are actually a cloud-based platform, so many tools can be leveraged within the cloud uh, platform, and I think that would be a really great opportunity for many researchers here to look at, you know, the deep dive on bi biology and sort of health and the social determinants piece. We actually have a lot of social determinants, um, including a survey that we've done, that when you add environmental data on top of that, can really um, highlight some of the things where we think there's an issue there, but you know, really getting much more granular on the environmental exposures, both from sort of heat and particulate matter all the way down to things that we haven't been thinking about within the health field that you guys have. We are really glad you are here. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, PCAS website has a, a list of the data sets and tools that could be utilized for its purpose. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, correct. Uh, my name is Yue Yang from uh, Northeastern University, and I'd like to raise a question for Dr. Mao. Uh, uh, in our lab, we are doing air quality modeling, and the wildfire is definitely a, an important component for our research. And uh, to my knowledge, there are many different set of wildfire data sets, like FIN or GFAT, GFAS, et cetera. Uh, I'm wondering if you've done any comparisons of your results and this this kind of data set. Yeah, we've been looking at that. Uh, thanks for a great question. We've been looking at that for a while, and uh, um, it also seems to us is how where you uh, how you inject your your uh, biofire. But when you look at daily surface PM 0.5, sometimes also about the timing of the the emissions, and there are a lot of uncertainty associated. With a custom model, often most models are using satellite uh, products as a driver for uh, wildfires. But for like pollen operators, you only like have a once per day coverage. And it's like, for example, you have, if your fire start like 8 a.m., but satellite only pass by by 1300, and then you're missing five hours of things. And then another uncertainty associated with that some sat satellite may, if it's cloudy, some satellite just cannot pick up. For example, some set, some emission are using fire relief power, but the fire if it's cloudy, satellite cannot pick up that fire relief power from space, and then that causes a lot of uncertainty. And we're just trying to try to figure out. But so far, it's hard to see which one is the best. Um, but our impression is that the most trusted one, the one we actually like to use most, is still called GFAT. It's the one very some burning area, but that's kind of six months to one year delay. You cannot use that for real time uh, modeling. Then, then, so there are lots of uh, issues. That's why we like to just combine all the tools to see if we can provide more real time uh, estimate for surface PM 0.5. But that's pretty fast. And I, I don't know if I answered your question yet. Thank you. Great. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> Ali Akanda. I'm in civil and environmental engineering at University of Rhode Island. I'm actually a hydrologist, but I'm interested in the intersection of heat and water stress. My uh, question is for Dr. Hu. Uh, in some of the results, I think I noticed that you mentioned that LST was found to be uh, cooler than the warmest spots and warmer than the coolest spots. What does that mean? Does that mean it missed the extremes? Uh, Oh, yeah, so sorry, I didn't elaborate on this part uh, because, uh, yeah, so this comparison is we estimate the ground of land surface temperature versus the pixel level. So these scatter plots represent their distribution uh, differences. And some of the extremes that we found on the ground, uh, like a ground LST actually cooler than the, the pixel level LST. So this is some, what I refer to, but the tail, you can see the low, uh, the cool spot, as you said, is typically warmer on the, on the ground than the pixel level. So there are some of, uh, but this is just to display some, uh, uh, a major part of the distribution, but not displayed all the dots that will be a little bit too um, messy on the plots. I don't know exactly how much of the, those like extreme uh, Pixels are located there, but this is kind of feeding the lines and to indicate the train. Okay, hope that <laughs> explains. Uh, does it does it answer your question? I, I think so. Uh, and when you say pixel, uh, where is that pixel uh, measurement coming from? Uh, so this is uh, represent the New York maps, and based on the map, you can see most of the 
hottest the spots, and then generally it's over my heightened regions, uh, like a uh, furrow. And uh, so there are some more urbanized areas is <laughs> showing the higher temperature in general. Okay. So that matches our general understanding of the surface heat island map of uh, like the patterns at, at large scale. But it, when we get into the neighborhood scale, there are some variations if we're using, uh, it depends on what like uh, temperature we are using uh, for measurement. Uh, if you don't mind, if, uh, uh, uh... Layman question on uh, some definitions. What is the difference between ground urban heat island and surface urban heat island? Okay, <laughs> sorry, I should explain that. So generally we get a map uh, that was a general surface urban heat island referred uh, refer to uh, the satellite based measurement, land surface temperature based uh, measurement of urban heat island. So we call surface urban heat island. So that is different from the atmosphere urban heat island that typically based on the air temperature. So there's a canopy, uh, under, uh, canopy layer urban heat islands or boundary layer urban heat island because the impact of the heat can be extended to right. the lower boundary layer. So they have a different levels of heat. But generally, if we directly measure from the satellite, which pixel does not resolve rooftop or canopies. So we just take all the temperature as, we, uh, as one to measure the heat. Uh, the ground ones we're trying to do is to separate those roof, top, and tree canopies. We just uh, focus on the ground where catastrophes are actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, walking and you know, activities on the ground bottom layer of the, the city. So that will going to better represent the the heat at local scale. So, like uh, any shading effects or some of the you know uh, other impacts like the uh, grasslands, how many kind of uh, those of uh, those cooling could reflect it better at uh, the ground level. So this is what we're trying to show. Uh, there, there's resources and the framework we can trying to provide more reliable data for heat, uh, at least for adaptation purpose. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you for the question. Um, yes. An online attendee has a question for the panel. Um, they didn't specify who. So the question is, are there opportunities for small or informal community groups to get involved? We live in a rural area of Minnesota with a lot of agriculture and manufacturing, and many community members have been growing, shared growing concerns about air quality. How, unfortunately, our local governments don't have the resources, expertise, or capacity to address these concerns. However, we do have some highly motivated community members who are willing to initiate engagement. Open question. Thank you, Chris. Sherry, do you want to? Well, um, I can say from the health aspect, we um, definitely have a lot of community uh, involvement. And actually, that's how we do a lot of our recruitment and retention is through community members who are already trusted in those communities. Um, as far as air quality, though, I think you might have a better understanding of rural populations and sort of how to get to some of those measurements more effectively. I would give it a try, I guess. <laughs> So I do think that NASA has lots of uh, resources that if you go to the NASA website, WorldView and uh, uh, many other tools, they provide uh, near real time uh, data about air quality, particularly PM 2.5. I know that it's been, uh, there are many data sources for that. And you can also look at set up AOD, airs of the depths. This also can provide you some information about local air pollution. Um, so I guess then another easy way is the citizen science. That this is something NASA has been really promoting the past 10 years, as well as with our agencies that if you spend $200 buy something called Purple Air, that's very cheap, plug in with Wi-Fi, and then can tell you real time, this PM 2.5. PM 2.5 is the particle matter less than 2.5 micron. That is often we care most about air quality for many places uh, because those particles can penetrate very deep into our lung and cause most uh, damage to our body. And uh, those particles concentration can be measured easily by purple air. If you plug in, you go to the purple website, you can just get that data right away. And uh, that can give you some information. I have lots of, we've been interacting with lots of our uh, local communities. They've been using purple air as a tool to understand, quantify their local air quality. And uh, 
if there are something you still like to develop, we are happy to talk more about it. And Purple Air does donate that data back up, right? So it's sort of you're participating in that research as well. Yes, that data is also automatically into uh, transferring to the cloud. But right now, I think you have to pay something to get along the historical data, but in near real time data, you can just get it right away. You click one button, three clicks, and you get a the, the buffer past two weeks. That's pretty easy. And uh, if you're not familiar with that, we're happy to tell you that. Other penalties you want to try? Um, they could also reach out to the Minnesota Environmental Public Health Tracking Program. I know I've worked with um, at least one of their epidemiologists pretty closely, and she's working on um, actually air quality, um, I think around wildfires, but she's been looking at um, the near real time national syndromic surveillance program data and how to use that um, in Minnesota. So you could reach out to her. Yeah, I just want to add to that, uh, thanks for all the excellent answers. And this is exactly the purpose of GCAST, right? So we want to listen to people who have a need, but may not necessarily have the resources to do the work. So we are here to help. Uh, we are, we'll be very happy to set up these new sections. Just contact the GCAST uh, uh, team leader, Tracy Holloway, or uh, Jenny, uh, who's doing communication for us. I'm sure uh, she, they will be very happy to, con to pair up um, you know, with the stakeholder and as well with doing the necessary work. Uh, so that's just another pool of uh, free resources uh, available for you guys. Uh, feel free to use it. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have two uh, quick questions. One is for uh, Dr. Hu. Uh, so regarding the um, the building heights, mean building heights, what data set did you use? Uh, is it satellite data or is it? No, it's some, uh, yeah, for New York City, they have public data available for individual building height. So we, we rely on that uh, for our analysis. But now I think there are some national program from USGS, if I recall correctly, they have LIDAR programs and provide some of the resources for cities. Um, probably, um, I would say my personal experience, um, major large cities should have the LIDAR, uh, like a building, a LIDAR data or derived building high information. Um, uh, I'm not sure nationally that will be available. I know there's a group from UT Austin, they're trying to use in Google and other, uh, like a machine learning, extract those building data set, uh, that could be useful, but I forgot their acronym, sorry. Uh, but it's the team from UT Austin. Uh, and uh, you can do a little bit more uh, search online. Thank you. Th uh, so I forgot to introduce my, uh, myself. My name is Xu Chao Liu. Um, and I'm working in Worcester Polytechnic Institute. It's a university about one hour from here. Uh, and my research focuses on air quality and thermal heat stress inside buildings. Because we spend most time inside, right? Mm -hmm. um, this room is too cold for me, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the question for um, uh, Dr. Mao, because uh, I um, I have some uh, anecdotal uh, comments from people who are inside Purple Air. So <laughs> anecdotal, I haven't confirmed, but the uh, the two piece of information really interesting to me is first is um, the accuracy and reliable of the sensor is big question mark. Uh, so they criticize uh, the accuracy of purple air sensors for particles. Uh, and uh, maybe I want to hear your comments on, uh, you know, when you compare or put all the data sources together and if some data is not reliable and how can you re reconcile that? Another piece of information is over 50% of the users unplug the sensor after one month use. So. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I want to hear your comments on that. Yes, yeah, thanks for a good question. Um, purple air is, is basically measuring the, the scattering light from, uh, from air beam. So, but it is, not a, it is not a research grade instrument. So that's often when we compare purple air to research grade instrument, we will uh, correct purple air by uh, the comparison. And that's most people will do is that they often collocate purple air with a, 
uh, AQS sites, uh, research grade instruments that often cost like 100 times more, <laughs> as like a, a beta attenuation monitor or other type of PM2.5 monitor that give you much more reliable information. On the other hand, hardware is uh, qualitatively give you a trend, give you some information, give you fun, it's still quite uh, useful because it's real time it's instead of FAM or FRM, that FRM is the federal reference uh, measurements. It takes about a year to get it to data. It's just, but it's in real time and uh, it's useful, I guess, it's, but it's not research grade. People be using that. And what we do from my group is that we correct that by comparing with co-located research grade instruments. And then from that, uh, we can use, by doing correction, we can have more fits in those prepared data. Um, that's uh, then and, uh, for your second question, if you unplug that, plug back in, um, I think my understanding for where there's two, uh, there's actually two sensors inside there and they have a little bit quality control. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Again, if you compare with research grade, again, that will help you to make sure that it does not drift too much. So far, we have not seen much uh, drifting. Uh, so one more thing is that I, I want to see for indoor air quality, actually, for where it's more uh, problematic because for air, because scanner does not capture really small particles less than 100 nanometer, for air is not sensitive to that. And therefore, if you are really talking about ultrafine particles, that prepare can be more uh, problematic. Uh, yeah, uh, not on purple air, Nancy Beer from Wyoming Air Quality Division. And um, when you're getting your data sets, one of the places to look at is the local air quality um, organization. Um, we can, when you mentioned about taking a year, if you come to the state of Wyoming, you can get the data right away. Um, and so okay. if you look to your local <laughs> and states and locals and tribes take pride in their air quality monitoring programs. And so if you're looking at data sets, we ask you to come to the state first instead of using EPAs because okay. there's flag data that people often don't get when they go into the EPA data set. And so it's better data for modeling and accuracy. That's good to know. But also I think for FRM, they often collect filters and they may put up balance and mayor the weight. That's at least from our uh, local agency, they sent the filter to uh, Davis, for example. To some places, they measure that all together and then to get that data back, it will take at least weeks or months. Not that, 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 there's some delay, but prepare is more real time. Yes. Does Purple Air work without Wi Fi? Yes, they have SD card version. So the data will be saved in the SD cards, and you have to go there to grab the data by yourselves. You know, to prepare, my problem is that it's the manpower is the most expensive part because you put away prepare is $200, but if you want to maintain a network with people we take care of that, that costs a lot more money. So we did one year that one summer, we actually end up spend most money on the travel for the person <laughs> go to the travel community to unplug the plug back in and check things that cost a lot more money and prepare yourself. So that's just something to uh, keep in mind, I guess. That's good to know, because we've been thinking about it for our tribal areas. You know, a lot of reservations yeah. and no air monitors. I should so. mention that there are also other low cost sensors too. They're like on AQ, others that does not require Wi-Fi. You can just talk to the cell phone tower Cost a little bit more money. So there, there's a wide spectrum of choices that you can choose from. It's just to sort of comment on that for um, you can, if you have community partners, citizen scientists, they can pull the, the SD card for you. And, and, and if you trust, you know, if you trust them and you have a working relationship with them, that, that makes the travel part a lot easier. Yeah. I have a question. Can I ask a question of the panel <laughs> and, and I guess the room too? So with the All of Us Research Program, we're also collecting digital health data. And so we connect to Apple Health Kit and Fitbit, but we hope to do additional sensors. So how do you sort of quantify the individual level data with sort of the high level data and reconcile that? You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, there's obviously chemicals and things like that that people are using on your body that are separate, but I'm talking about like, you know, there's sensors already in an Apple Watch and not Fitbit, but how do you how do you reconcile the two and does one trump the other? Very top crossing. I'd really like to try it. <laughs> well um I I I can give a try first and you can okay. provide what I mean. Um 
for anybody walking around, right? You know, you have this body cloud surrounding you uh, from your skin, from your vision, from your nose. So the in-person monitor is going to definitely give you a different read from your ambient monitor. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, we should not expect that they're going to give you the same thing. Uh, just because human is the emission source at the same time, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's about uh, six feet. The cloud is about six feet. So the, the, the concentration near your body, six feet, is different from the cloud. Yeah, that's why we have this, <laughs> this policy uh, during COVID. Uh, it's it's all yeah. actually based on science. Yeah. Um, and, and how do we get this together? I think this is a, a vast um, resources that, that we have not tapped into, yeah. right? Um, right. And those are, are good, the wearable, wearable instruments. Uh, it will become more and more popular, um, you know, and, and we are going to get more used to it. But this is probably a, a really a brand new research question. Um, how do we utilize this new data? And of course, like control the quality. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I don't really have a good answer for you, Sherry, but I did have a question. And so this is a bit of a basic question. I'm Sydney, I work with NASA's capacity building program. So training and workforce development for using earth observations. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the kinds of decisions you're hoping to help your participants in the program make about their lives using like this environmental exposure data. Well, I can give you an example from the health side or from the genomic side, at least. And so you get an idea of sort of where we're at there and, you know, sort of matching that from the environmental side. So um, the genomics that we actually return to people are actual actionable variants, right? So it's something they can do something about. So it's the BRCA1 and 2, the Lynch syndrome. And we actually do that through clinical grade testing so they can bring something to their doctor. When you think about the environmental side, there's not sort of that environmental counselor, like there's a genetic counselor. There's not sort of a, a person you can go to and say, now what does this mean? And we are in very, we're dealing with underserved populations. So it's not like we can say, you're in a really bad area, you need to move. Like that is not actionable within our populations, right? So um, what can we give them that they actually can do something about would be the key. And I don't have an answer to that yet. Um, we are working with the NIEHS CORDS group on sort of how they're returning information broadly about environment and health and how it applies to, um, to individuals. But, you know, that's very, very broad. And, and there, there was actually an NIH funding announcement or um, group put together to think about for environmental return. What does that look like? You know, we've done so much on sort of the health and genomic related return. And we want to give people something they can actually do something about. What does that mean for environment? Because it's so much broader. So I'd love to talk more about that because we don't know what their sort of right piece is. Yeah. I really appreciate that because it sounds like you, you're asking, you know, scientists, what data do you have that we should be using? And we're like, well, what data do you need to make a better decision? And that right. seems like a really good area for collaboration too. Yeah, thanks. I agree. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Uh, the the decision making that um, you're talking about is it what level is that? Is that at the policymaker level, organizational level, or individual decision making you're talking about? So I think we can inform all of those, right? Sort of we think about it like a social ecological model. Um, the one that I'm talking about right now is individual levels. So like, what can they do to improve their um, environment around them, or at least be aware of what they're being exposed to? because then they can modify other things in their life, right? So um, we hope that we're able to also really affect state policies and local policies and even federal policies, but we're not there yet. But we are sort of pushing the bar and sort of engaging with our participants so they're actually part of the research study and getting something back. And I think that's definitely the way that health research is going, where they are actually partners in what we're doing and that's not going to change when we bring environmental data in. We have a question. Me too. Yeah. So this is a question from online for all the panelists again. Um, how are data on UHI and AQ and indicators derived from them, such as the CVI, informing or perhaps failing to inform specific solutions or programs on the local level for managing air pollutions and urban extreme heats, environmental health risks? When I say solutions and problems, they might include the cooling, the opening of cooling centers or the planting of additional vegetation and trees, among others. 
how much are data sparseness and gaps preventing us from knowing where these interventions are? So, yeah, I mean, this has been the first summer that we've had the urban heat maps that were developed. And so just in the last couple of months, you know, we've been giving a lot more heat workshops and trying to promote these um, and just let people know that we have them. Um, between those and then um, the heat risk map that was developed by the National Weather Service and then CDC just launched on Earth Day, their kind of repackaged heat map, heat risk map um, that gives also the air quality index and links to like the, you know, what you can do to protect yourself. Um, those two together seem really useful for like city planners and emergency planners. Um, I know our biggest city is the city of Albuquerque and they had previously done like an urban heat map and they have a whole urban heat cohort where it includes, um, it's led by the Office of Sustainability and includes like urban forestry and us and air quality. And they tried to bring in as many partners as they could, including like, um, there's an NGO that represents um, the unhoused population and a disabilities organization that I'm blanking on the name. Um, so they're trying to take a more holistic approach um, in the absence of having the resources of a big city. It seems like just having the urban heat map and the heat risk um, seem helpful for people to know when to open cooling centers, where to place the cooling centers, um, we had a meeting recently um, where they were talking about doing pop-up cooling centers because um, a lot of times cooling centers are building public buildings that are already in place, right? Like libraries or community centers, um, which are fine, but then you have to get people there and get people to access them. And you know, if people have pets, they don't want to leave their pets. Um, so they were thinking of putting these pop-up shelters, um, basically like tents with coolers. Um, and looking at the maps to see where it would make the most sense. Um, and then also, you know, where the people would be that would use them and how to make it accessible to them. Um, so they seem very useful. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you used, uh, no, I think you covered most of, I know from academia background. So uh, typically what, uh, you know, risk is it has to be physical environment and the people of vulnerable population that can cause the hazards. So what we're trying to do with NASA data resources we provide some environmental uh, information. So I think the government and uh, <coughs> um, could provide them, uh, add other components in here to make the decision cool. Right? Yeah. So I think this is a great collaboration. <laughs> we yeah. need it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just had a thought as you guys were talking about um, uh, electricity and reliability and these times <laughs> that might be needed for these pop-up centers or cooling centers. And from a personal level, you get to, um, I pay attention to my electric bill. And so I get to notice that my electric rates are going to be variable and they're going to go higher during the very period of time when the heat's going to be the highest and the use is the greatest. And I'm just thinking about from a health perspective of locating people and trying to get people to the cooling centers or to turn the electricity and not use it during those time periods and what effect that might have on these different, I'll call it from the electric reliability or the public service commission. Um, uh, that may be another interesting area to, to look at how it drives that particular behavior and if the need skyrockets because people can't afford it. Yeah, we also in our first messaging of the season, um, we include the link where people can um, register for, I forget the whole thing, but basically if you're low income, you can apply for utility assistance. And so we always include that in our first message of like, you know, get prepared for the summer if you need help paying your bills then apply here. So that way it's set up in time for the summer when it gets really hot. Um, we've also, with these workshops we've been doing, it came up where a lot of, a significant portion of the tribal community um, doesn't have electricity. And so we had to think and develop, you know, 
passive cooling strategies, like what can you do in the absence of electricity to cool your house and cool your body off, um, which would also work in the event of a power failure, um, which fortunately we have not had that, but we know it will come eventually. So good point, thank you. Very interesting. Any other questions? <coughs> Uh, yeah, Shicha uh, Liu. I have a question for uh, Dr. Nagar uh, regarding the. Uh, not sure if you have engaged with the residents, local resident, residents, to collect their, you know, responses or possibly interview with them. Uh, if in the future, going to be some research. Um, have you or would you plan to engage more local residents? Our hope is. Um that one of the proposals will come through and we'll have funding for that and dedicated staff. And with that, it's absolutely working more at the community level, um, both getting data down to the granular community level and working more directly um, with, um, and those specifically target the most high risk communities to start. Um, but yes, absolutely, hopefully we'll uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about the strategies uh, on engaging with the local participants because it's very challenging. Can we share some? <laughs> yeah, so first off we have, um, they're called public health offices. So we have a centralized health department where our health department covers the entire state and we don't have county health departments, um, but we do have public health offices that are located in a number of communities around the state. Um, so we would work with them and then the promotoras and like, um, the local health community health workers. Um, we would also probably network with our partners who have been doing more of the community level um, direct engagement and see where they could lead us and hopefully help us out. Um, Thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, I think we have to take one more question. We'll end up wrap up in this session. Last chance. Okay. <laughs> Xiaohua, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Xiaohua again. So I have a question for Mao. Yeah. So um, a comment and a question. Comment is I think uh, I will echo the importance of a study welfare in Alaska, the high latitude, because it's not only the, the people is uh, not too much, but uh, the it will contribute to Arctic haze, and which will amplify the Arctic warming. Yes. Okay, question. <laughs> question is uh, because of high latitude in Alaska and also the high air video, so how do you, I mean, how do you do because a uh, long year of uh, without, uh, you know, snow covering, ice covering, and the no sunlight. So, how do you leverage satellite data with, uh, in your study? It's challenging for satellite data. That's a very, very good. Uh... Point. And so we, that's why we most study in summer because summer was, <laughs> the, the land is not covered by snow. So the albedo go back to very low uh, albedo because in winter, there are no, as you mentioned, there are no sunlight. There's no, uh, there are lots of snow on ground. The satellite retrieval, has, we cannot trust satellite retrieval for many, most cases. So, but that's why we most focus on summer uh, where you have twilight. Uh, and uh, you sometimes also people look at uh, spring, like uh, it's called zombie fire. You know, this is a new new uh, topic. A lot of people talk about some fire can just stay there throughout winter. And uh, you can use set that to maybe instead of look at UV or you can maybe get some infrared signal there that can give you some information about zombie fire. This is also a topic people realize even in Alaska, there are some zombie fire can just survive the winter. Not too many. <laughs> and so it is uh, it is a challenge for remote sensing um, that's why we do mostly on ground also we use ground-based measurements to validate that that's why we use aeronet we're also adding some pandora and instrument to validate satellite thank you we want to thank you all the speakers and all panelists for your wonderful discussion thank you very much